May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me everything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Then Eli said, he is the Lord, let him do what is good in his eyes. Now, here's what we need to underscore. Verse number 19, this is where we're taking our premise. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground, underscore that. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. I'm going to read that one more time. I want you to hide like that, underscore that. Verse 19, the Lord was with Samuel as he grew up and let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba which is a well, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. I'm going to title this text. I want you to look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, don't spill it. Don't spill it. If it's not clear to you now, it will be clear by the end. Say it again. Look at your neighbor and say, don't spill it. Don't spill spill it father in the name of jesus i thank you right now for your anointing and presence that is in this place i thank you for your spirit that is hovering that is moving in this sanctuary right now i thank you for the well that is in this room the canals that are in this room the water that is flowing in this room spring up a well in this place spring up a well in this house we thank you for living water running water in this room we give you praise we give you honor we give you glory in jesus mighty name we pray somebody shout amen as you're taking your seat somebody shout amen, amen. hallelujah water is the basis of life life depends on water after about three days you will die for the lack thereof Historically, civilizations who harnessed water thrived, but those who did not failed. Here in Texas, we recently experienced water scarcity. We had an energy crisis recently uh, where the accessibility or the access to water for many became scarce. And we had boil water notices in which we, we, we had to boil our water before drinking it out of the risk of something being wrong or the water not being clean or pure. And it was this past month as we dealt with this energy crisis and this somewhat of this water crisis that we locally began to realize that water actually has a value. You typically don't realize or understand that when typically you have access to water at any given time. But for us locally, when the energy crisis broke out, and pipes began to bust, and people didn't have access to turn their water on. And when they tried to run to the grocery store to get water, there was none to get, no bottled water to get. We realized that water is actually more valuable than we realized. Water is essential to life. There is no movement without water. There's no growth without water. There's no revitalization without water. Water brings healing. In fact, aside from the spoken word of God in the beginning, God did not dare to create without water. Let's look at Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. It declares, in the beginning, somebody shout, in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Now that word moving actually means hovering or brooding. Earth at this point, it was in a dark and empty state. Earth was in a chaotic state. But even in its chaos, there was some pre-existing matter that the Bible mentions here that was called water. You see, in the beginning in Genesis chapter 1, when you examine Genesis 1 very carefully, you'll see that earth is in a flooded state. It's dark, it's empty, and it's void, but there is the movement of water. 
And the spirit of God is hovering over this water. It's brooding over this water. As the Bible says that the Spirit of God was moving over this water, it paints a picture of a bird nesting over its eggs, waiting for them to hatch. It's, this is the Spirit's brooding or hovering over the waters as God's incubation process for creation. The Spirit of God himself is hovering or brooding over the, the waters that existed because it's going to be a basis and a process for development. I want you to stay with me. As we break down this thing called water in this series of the whale. Dry land and heavenly bodies and plants and animals were formed from the elements of water. Water was a part of God's creative process. There was the spoken word, yes. But he uses the element of water to begin to create. And similar to wisdom, water was always there from the beginning. This is how critical water was from day one in the process of creation. Water is so critical that the human body in which God created from the soil and breathed the breath of life into consists of 60 to 70 percent of water. As we talk about whales, you and I are both, in a sense, a whale. Naturally, we're made up of 60 to 70 percent water. Modern nations have had violent conflict behind water. People fight over water. People have killed over water. In Yemen, there was fighting over water. In Darfur, there's been conflict over water. In Nigeria, there have been conflict over water. Tensions rise because of water. Tensions rise because the lack thereof water. And the Bible talks about conflict whales. As we talk about whales in, in, in the springing forth of water, there are whales that brought about conflict in Scripture. It's in Genesis chapter 26, verse 19, it declares, But when Isaac's servant dug in the valley and found there was a well of flowing water, the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with the herdsmen of Isaac, saying, The water is ours. So he named the well Esek because they contended with him. Then they dug another well and the quarreled over him too. So he named it Sitna. So Isaac is an avid well digger. And every time Isaac digs a well, conflict breaks out. The first well he called Esek means quarrel or dispute. Because when he found or identified a well, conflict broke out. People tried to fight him over this new resource that he had identified. And one thing about Isaac is I'm amazed at his ability to dig because digging wells was not an easy process. They didn't have the tools and the technology that we have today. They had to dig with limestone. Digging a well was a deep process. It was a dirty process. It was a lengthy process. It required strategy and intentionality. Building, digging a well took work. Digging a well was not easy. Digging a well was a dirty process. And Isaac, who is an entrepreneur, won't stop digging. It's during a time of famine that God tells him to go to Gerar. And the reason God tells him to go to Gerar, he says, I want you to move to Gerar because this is where in famine I'm going to prosper you. And one thing to take note of when it comes to Isaac moving to Gerar is your prosperity is linked or connected to your soil of where God calls you to. Had he stayed in Egypt, he would not have prospered. But the location of Isaac was instrumental in his prosperity. And you have to be quite sensitive in where God calls you to go because where he calls you to go is directly connected to your ability to prosper. And Isaac is an entrepreneur. He's a money man. Isaac knows how to make money. In fact, the Bible declares that he sold in one year and reaped 100 fold in the same year. Isaac was so prosperous, the government exiled him. The government of Bimelech said, you've become too much for us. You've got to go down to the valley. And Isaac, being an entrepreneur, goes down to the valley and begins to dig, and he identifies a whale. 
No matter what you put Isaac through or what environment you put Isaac in, somehow Isaac knows how to identify a new frontier. No matter what environment you put me in, no matter where you exile me, something in me is always going to find a way. Something in me is going to identify a new blue ocean. Something in me is going to identify uncontested market space that no one has tapped into before. Something inside of me is going to identify a resource. But every time Isaac identifies a resource, a quarrel breaks out. Isaac can't find anything without somebody trying to fight him for it. Isaac can't identify anything with somebody else trying to say that what he identified belongs to him. Isaac can't identify anything with someone trying to take his life or what he found and identified. But no matter what is happening in the region, Isaac is determined to prosper. And I believe I'm talking to some people right now in this room that no matter what's happening or what's going on around you, you are determined to prosper. But any entrepreneur in this room, I know I'm talking to somebody who is determined to prosper. Staying up late and waking up early, I'm determined like Isaac to dig. And I won't stop digging until I find water. I won't stop digging until I find a new resource. I won't stop digging until I find a well. I won't stop digging. Somebody shout dig. Isaac had a knack for identifying resources. When water and resources were scarce, Isaac knew how to identify water. And God is calling us to be a resourceful people. That even in times of chaos and lack and scarcity, something in me is able to find and identify new wells and new resources. You see, one thing about ancient Israel is ancient Israel is a semi-arid place. Israel is a dry place. In fact, most wells were not reliable as they were dependent upon scarce rainfall. Most wells that people identified in the, in the biblical days were not fully dependent because once the rain stopped, the well ran dry. And one thing you have to understand when it comes to wells is not all wells are equal. In this day and age, you have to be very careful about what wells you're running to to receive information. Because right now, we're living in a time where everybody is putting out wells and resources for people to drink from. And if you're not careful, there are some wells that you'll run to that'll run dry on you. There are some wells that you'll drink from that cannot be sustained. There are some church models that are not sustainable. Every well you drink from, you've got to question the source of its water. How is the water supplied from this well? Is it dependent upon rainfall or does the water come from subterranean streams? The best well is, is, is the kind of well where the water comes from the ground. Because when that water comes from the ground, it's not dependent upon rainfall or the elements. The well is rooted in something deeper. What is the depth of your well? You better question every well you get access to. Every well you approach, every well you try to drink from, you need to question and examine the validity and the source of its water. Well, how does this well get its water? How does this ministry get its water? How does this church thrive off water? What is it dependent on? I want a well that's deep. I want a well that's hollow and that's open where when that water is running underground, there's an opening in the dirt where that water can flow. God is looking for open people. When we talk about this thing called water, we've been walking through this thing on water. God would use prophets to administer water. There is a deep connection between the prophetic and water. In 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 19, the Bible declares the people of the city said to Elisha, Look, our Lord, this town is well sustained. As you can see that the water is bad and the land is unproductive. Bring me a new bowl, Elisha said. And he put salt in it, so they brought it to him. Then he went out to the spring and threw the salt into, the, into it, saying, this is what the Lord says. I have healed this water. 
Never again will it cause death or make the land unproductive. And the water was, had remained pure in this day according to the word Elisha had spoken. You see, we see the prophet Elisha, not Elijah, but the successor Elisha purifying the water, healing the water, cleansing the water. The water was so bad in Jericho that it caused the land to be unproductive. The land was miscarriaging. This is, this is how important water is to any economy. That when the water is bad, the land cannot produce. When the water is bad, the land begins to miscarriage. The land begins, it, it can't function as it needs to. So they run to the prophet to say, we are in an economic crisis. What are you going to do about our water shortage? And Elisha heals the water. He restores the water. There's a connection between the prophetic and what I want to submit to you, that water administration is prophetic ministry. I said water administration is prophetic ministry. And as we see natural droughts in the scriptures, and as we look at society and nations, there is also spiritual droughts. We have natural droughts, and then we have spiritual droughts. Amos chapter 8 verse 11 declares the days are coming declares the Lord that when I will send a famine through the land not a famine of food or thirst for water but a famine of hearing the word of the Lord people will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east searching for the word of the Lord but they will not find it the Bible makes clear that outside of natural famine and natural drought, there is a spiritual drought that happens. There's a spiritual drought that comes. In fact, in Psalm 42, the writer says, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go to meet with God? Deep, verse 7, calls to deep. And the roar of your waterfalls, all of the waves and the breakers have swept over me. In this writing, the, the writer of this psalm is missing the sanctuary. He hasn't been in the sanctuary in quite some time. We've been in an era. We've, been, we've had a, a year of spiritual panting. Where the people of God spiritually have been looking and thirsting for water. We have found ourselves in the year 2020 and even coming in, moving in the year 2021 in Psalm 42. Where the writer has, because of exile, has not been in the sanctuary for quite some time. And the writer is remembering what God did. He's remembering what God has, has done. He's remembering the sanctuary. He's remembering the songs that were sung. He's remembering the praise. He's remembering the fellowship. He's remembering the preached word. He's remembering the worship. The writer of Psalm 42 is remembering the sanctuary. And the writer is thirsty. He says, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul thirsts and longs after thee. But then he says, deep calls to deep. And I begin to look at that scripture on the deep calling to deep. And begin to examine what he meant by the deep calling to deep. And what the Lord showed me and revealed to me was so mind-blowing. He says, the deep of man's need calls to the deep of God's fullness. And the deep of God's fullness calls to the deep of man's need so God can pour himself. I'm going to say that one more time. As he is panting for water and as he says the deep calling for the deep, he's empty looking for God to pour. And the Lord said the deep man's need calls to the deep of God's fullness. In other words, when you are empty, you have every right to call on the fullness of God. And as you call on the fullness of God in your emptiness, the deep of God's fullness calls to the deep of your necessity so he can pour himself. God is looking to pour. He's open to pour. Even in your lack, he's full. When you don't have enough, he's full. When you're dry, he's full of water. When you're thirsty, he's full of water. When, you need, when you're dehydrated, he's full of hydration. He is willing to pour when the people are looking for water. 
Coming to my opening text, Samuel is born in an era of spiritual drought. In 1 Samuel 3, he says, in those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. Historically, we see drought. We see the value and the importance of wells and the, how essential water is to life. And then we have a spiritual drought. And Samuel is born into an era where the voice of the Lord is rare. There's no water. There's no prophetic word. There's no vision. There is, the word of the Lord is not there. It, it exists, but it is rare. There's only a few instances in which you see a prophetic release. But Israel now is in a spiritual drought. And a part of the destiny of Samuel is to bring water where a country or a city is dry. And so God brings Samuel into this era of, of where the priesthood is dysfunctional. But before we can really talk about Samuel, we have to really examine Hannah. Because without Hannah, there is no Samuel. Samuel or Hannah rather desired to have a child. And the Bible says that the Lord closed her womb. And every year they would go to make a sacrifice and Penina would mock Hannah. So much so that Hannah became depressed and distressed. Year after year, they would go up to the, te to the temple to offer their sacrifice, and she was without child. And the Bible says specifically in 1 Samuel 1 verse 5 that it was God who closed her womb. And how do we process life when the reason for your pain is God's doing? You see, the reason why she doesn't have a child has nothing to do with what the devil did. She doesn't need deliverance. It was God that closed her womb. God is the source of, of her pain, and Penina knew it. And because Penina knew it, she kept vexing Hannah, and God is the reason for it. I want to tell you that there is purpose in your pain. There are some things that happen to us in life that we don't understand. There are some things that happen in life that either God does or God allows that we don't get. But it happens because there is some type of purpose or prophetic calculation that God has put in place because he's trying to push something out of you. The source of a pain was God's doing. God did this. The reason for her agony, God was behind it. The reason for her pain, God was actually, this was God's fault. God, you really did this. The reason for my pain and my depression, you are the source of what is happening to me year after year. I pray, I fast, I travail, I weep, I groan, I moan, and everybody around me is experiencing breakthrough and blessing. Everybody around me is getting pregnant, but for some reason you chose to close my womb. Different key. God did this. And there are some issues in life that we have that God is actually behind it. There's some pain in your life that God is actually behind. There's some things you're dealing with that God is actually behind. God is trying to set you up because he's trying to use you as a conduit that would release a source of water. There's purpose in your pain. There's purpose in your pain. But, but look, at, look at what Hannah accesses. Year after year, Hannah goes up to the sacrifice. And nothing happens. But in 1 Samuel chapter 1, she prays something specifically, and God moves on it. After years of prayer, she finally makes one vow. She says, Lord... If you give me a child, I'll give him back to you. Year after year, she prayed. Year after year, she went to the temple and nothing happened. God closed it. But she prayed one specific prayer. And that one specific prayer allowed God to open her womb. And what did she pray? She said, Lord, if you give me a son, I'll give him back to you. 
Notice after she had Samuel, the Bible declares she had five other children. The first one was just a struggle. Everything after the first came easy. It is my belief. It was never the will of God for her not to have a child. According to God's prophetic timetable, he needed Hannah to be willing to give her Samuel. Because God knew, I've got to set the nation up for a transition. I need to put him right under Eli. Once you give me Samuel so I can put him under Eli, fertility is fair game. The revelation is this. If you're experiencing any stagnation in any area of your life, you need to examine what you have not given to God. She tapped into a revelation that if I give God this child, something might happen. If I make a commitment to give God this seed, something might open up. In the moment she said, I will give you this seed, I will give you this child, her womb opened up from there. There are some areas in your life in which you are experiencing stagnation that you need. Once you give something to God, you're going to see it begin to open. I'm intrigued with Elkanah, though. The father of Samuel. The husband of Hannah. If you notice in 1 Samuel chapter 1, starting at verse 1, the Bible opens up in that scripture by telling you Elkanah's background and who he came from and who his father was and who his grandfather was. If you study those individuals carefully, you will come to find that Elkanah was actually a Levite. But he was not serving in the temple. Elkanah is witnessing God doing something in Samuel that he was supposed to be doing. And I want to tell you that whatever you drop in your generation, your seed will pick it right up. Whatever you fail to do, the next generation will pick it right up. Elkanah went to offer sacrifices every year, but that was the requirement of every Israelite man. That was nothing specific or nothing new. Something in me believes that Elkanah may have been out of place, and he has to witness the priesthood through his son. Every year his mother makes a robe and brings it to, to Samuel. That's something that he should have been doing. Perhaps he could have been mentoring his son in the priesthood, but something went missing in the bloodline. Something may have went missing in his decision making. The Bible makes it clear through the bloodline that Elkanah was a Levite, but for some reason we don't see this man serving in the temple. And we have many people who are called but are not serving. We have many people who come a couple of times a year and they give their tithe and, and they give to the capital campaign, but they won't plug in. They, they won't submit themselves to the house of God. Elkanah is born into the Levitical priesthood, but he is out of place. How many people are out of place? You know what you're born into. You're born into the, to the Levitical priesthood, but for some reason, you've chosen to not serve in the temple. Something is missing. Something is out of place. Samuel is born. I'm almost through. Samuel is born. And he comes into a dysfunctional priesthood. When Samuel comes on the scene, in a spiritual drought, somebody shout drought. In this drought, spiritual fathers were not disciplining their sons. Judgment came upon Eli because he knew what to do and would not do it. Eli didn't have the, he lacked the backbone to correct. He was like a jellyback preacher. He couldn't stand. He wasn't firm. He would not correct his sons for anything. And I believe we're in a time right now where there is a lack of discipline, where people are running wild and doing whatever and saying whatever because we need fathers in place who will get some sons in check.
But Eli is a church leader who himself cannot see. His vision has failed. He could not provide vision for the future. And the priesthood of this time, the priesthood leadership couldn't see. They couldn't provide vision for what was to come. And the scripture is clear that the preachers were sleeping with the women. Hophni and Phinehas were running through women in the sanctuary. Sleeping with every woman in the temple gate. They had the nerve to take the fat from the offering. Now, you got to understand how they messed up here. Because when you take the fat from the offering, the fat is symbolic of the glory of God. Fat is glory. When they took the fat from the offering to eat for themselves, they were usurping God's glory. These are priests trying to take the glory of God to themselves. And God could not have this. What I find so amazing is that Samuel was mentored by Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas. These men raised him up in priesthood. His mother gave him to these these individuals. The example that Samuel had was that of Eli, who could not see, and Hophni and Phinehas, who did whatever they wanted to do. They mentored him. They reared him in the priesthood. I have no doubt in my mind. That Samuel was exposed to the activities of Hophni and Phinehas. He knew his spiritual brothers were sleeping with women. He knew they were taken from the sacrifice and eating the fat of the offering. But what I find so amazing, that in light of what he saw and what he was exposed to, Samuel maintained his purity. And I want to tell you that no matter what you saw growing up in ministry, you have a responsibility to maintain your prophetic purity. Something kept Samuel in light of what he saw. Something kept Samuel in light of the bad example he received. But something in him would not allow his prophetic purity to let go. In light of what he saw, Samuel remains pure. And the Bible declares this. Here's where I'm closing now in 1 Samuel 3. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up. And let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. Now watch this. We talk about this thing called water. When the Bible declares that none of Samuel's words fell to the ground, this is a metaphor. Of course it means that, yes, whatever he said came to pass. But that phrase is actually a Hebrew metaphor that is derived from water being spilt on the ground. Somebody say, don't spill it. Samuel was a well to his generation. And God did not allow Samuel to spill his water. There is a difference between spilling and pouring. Spilling is unintentional. Pouring is intentional. Spilling is wasting. Pouring is investing. Spilling happens when we get off balance. Oops. I... I didn't mean to spill it. It comes when we're off balance. But pouring is an intentional flow. Spilling is wasting your potential. Pouring is living with purpose. Samuel was born into an era of spiritual drought where the voice of God was rare. In in the era where the voice of God was rare in drought, one man formed a school of prophets. How in the world... Just one man who comes into an era where the voice of God is not heard, there's a drought. And he takes the rarity of God's voice and creates an entire school of the prophetic. He taught a whole generation how to hear. And the Bible says from Dan to Beersheba, everyone knew who Samuel was. 
Samuel, I believe, was a whale that taught his generation how to drink prophetically. And the Bible declares in John chapter 7, verse 38, whoever believes in me as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Not only did Jesus declare himself as a whale, but he came to make you and I a whale. It's not about what I can drink only, but about God making me a whale to my generation. Samuel is a carrier of water and brings water to a generation that is in drought. And I have made a commitment to God to pour my life out like a drink offering. And before I leave this life, Lord, make me a whale. I want to be a whale to nations. I want to be a whale. See, John 7 and 38 is bigger than just tongues. It is the, this living water that Jesus talks about is the fullness of his spirit moving and flowing through you to feed people. It is the fullness of all that the spirit of God consists of that people can actually drink from. And I've determined in my heart, in my mind, that I am going to be, oh, somebody says, Lord, make me a whale. I want you to lift up your hands right now and shout, Lord, make me a whale. Like Samuel, I want you to send me to places of drought. And from my presence, people learn how to actually drink. You see, one thing about water is that you had some whales that were dependent upon rainfall. But there were some whales that were supplied from subterranean water, subterranean spring. In other words, the water is there. It's just trying to find an opening. The water is there underground, but it's trying to find an opening through the rock, through the soil, through the clay, through the dirt, through the humanity. It's trying to find a hollow opening. But the moment it finds an opening, it begins to flow out. The Lord is going to move and flow through you as you are open. You're like clay, but when that water finds its opening in you, the area of your life in which you surrender, there's an open flow. There's a river that flows. Somebody say, God, make me a whale. God, I want to be a resource. Come on. God, I want to, I want to be a whale of supply. God, I want to be a whale of healing. God, I want to be a whale of wisdom. God, I want to be a whale of solutions. God, I want to be a whale of insight. God, I want to be a whale of strategy. God, I want to be a whale of instruction. I want to be a whale of creativity. I want to be a whale of finances. Lord, in my generation, make me a whale. Come on, somebody cry that out to God right now. Lord, make me a whale in my generation. Where there is drought, I want to be a whale. When there's drought, uh, I want water to flow through me. Come on. Lord, make me a resource. Uh, I want to build a city. I want to end poverty. I want to build a resource center. God, make me a whale. Come on, cry that out to him. Lord, make me a whale. Make me a resource. Uh, make me a river of living water. Let living water flow out of me. Let living water flow from me. Uh, I want resources flowing out of me. I want provision flowing out of me. Somebody cry, Lord, make me a whale. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you right now in this room for every individual that is here under the sound of my voice. Father, we commit our lives to pouring out our lives like a drink offering. And before we leave this earth, we will be a whale that you've called us to be. We'll be a whale to our generation. We'll be a whale to our city. We'll be a whale to our nation. We'll be a whale to our community. We'll be a whale of resource. We'll be a whale of solution. We'll be a whale of insight. Lord, allow me to pour. Allow us to pour to the glory of God. The Lord wants to make you a whale. He wants to make you a resource. If you believe that, shout hallelujah.